Welcome, welcome to our brown bag. We'll get started in just a minute. We have Dr. Beverly Irby with us and Dr. Asim Ali as well. So we're about to get started. I'm glad you're here this afternoon. Okay, Dr. Irby, take oh. it away and I'll keep letting people in as they join because I know more people are joining as we speak. Thank you so much, Jordan. Thank you for organizing the technology for us. And um, we are happy to have um, Dr. Asim Ali with us today, this afternoon, now afternoon. And uh, he's going to be uh, sharing some things on artificial intelligence and how we can use those things to our advantage as teachers, professors uh, in our classrooms uh, to, uh, to actually improve our teaching and enhance our instructional uh, instruction in the classroom. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Ali. Uh, he is the executive director of the BGO Center for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning at Auburn University. Dr. Ali co-leads Auburn's Augmented and Virtual Reality Initiative, AUX, in collaboration with the Office of Information Technology. Dr. Ali also co-leads work on artificial intelligence for the Office of the Provost to build faculty capacity for understanding and implementing AI in teaching and learning. He holds a bachelor's degree in software engineering, a master's degree in information systems management, and a PhD in adult education from Auburn University. Dr. Ali is the founding director of Auburn Online and also teaches Introduction to Information Systems Management at the Harvard College of Business. He is active in several professional organizations, including serving as a board member of UPCEA and the, which is the leading national organization for online learning and administration. And I met Dr. Ali just last week in a, an SEC uh, event where uh, we had a panel and he was one of the panelists and I thought was the very best panelist. So we got in touch with him on uh, how we could use uh, AI in our classrooms. And so voila, here we are today, and we are so excited to be able to present Dr. Asim Ali, who is going to be sharing his message today. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for joining us. We appreciate it here from Aggieland uh, to, a, to a sort of a sister university in our SEC system. So thank you so much. Absolutely. A pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Beverly. I think I'm going to start with a howdy. Is that right? Did I get it kind of close? Um, uh, I've got a, a, a set of slides that I'll go through, but they're just really just to kind of guide the conversation. I think we've got about 20 ish people. Uh, and so, you know, you can raise your hand and maybe use other ways of getting attention. We can go through questions as well as we go through them. Um, so just today, uh, you know, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. We'll go through some introductory concepts of artificial intelligence, um, the teaching and learning implications. I'll share uh, some ways that I'm using AI in my classroom that I'm teaching in terms of a course redesign that I did. Uh, and then teaching with AI, we've developed a course at Auburn for our faculty and professional staff. I'm going to be able to share the idea around that course, what that looks like. And some possible takeaways and some next steps for you will certainly uh, allow enough time for question and answer uh, today as well, uh, because the conversation element of it is really important. True to education form, I want to make sure that I share outcomes with you. Uh, so you should be able to describe the difference between narrow and general AI after today. Uh, at least share one example of an assignment redesign that is working for someone who's using it. That would be me. Uh, we'll share some techniques for utilizing AI and what are called uh, natural language processing or NLP tools. And then we'll discover Auburn's approach to faculty development for AI. I put experience because uh, this is a course that we've developed for our faculty and professional staff. And we certainly are working with 
different universities on ways of making it more broadly available. Certainly don't want you to feel like you have to replicate the work. And you know, if there's a way for us to make it available to you, certainly are interested in exploring that. Um, so Beverly did such a great job of introducing me. I'm not gonna dive in too much deeper, but yes, I do have a varied academic background, but then also have had the privilege of uh, a lot of varied professional experiences as well. Started in this role as an executive director of the Big EO Center, which is our central unit for supporting all faculty uh, development and instructional support from a central uh, resource. Um, and uh, started this role in January of 2020. Timed it really well for the pandemic, uh, but uh, now that we've emerged from that and uh, are able to respond to other more, more interesting uh, things as well, this is, you know, that's what allows us to meet today, I think. Uh, I think more important to share with you are pictures of my recent trip to uh, to uh, Aggie Land, and I had a great time with my friends. Had awesome seats, sat with some wonderful folks. Uh, a real memorable time. That's me outside my uh, I think favorite building on your campus, which is the uh, innovative uh, learning classroom building. Uh, really impressive. I think we need more spaces like that on our campuses with the folks that really uh, enable that uh, engagement for our students and our faculty. Um, so uh, let's, uh, you can use the chat to do this or we can, you know, we, we can uh, do this, but what are the first couple of words that come to mind when you first uh, hear of artificial intelligence? How does that make you feel? Let's kind of do a little quick temperature check, uh, maybe in the, uh, in the chat, if you would just. Go ahead and feel free to drop the three Here words that come to okay. mind in the chat. Here it comes. Okay. Uh, and so uh, certainly we're seeing, uh, you know, a lot of different range of experiences. And certainly, yes, it is. Uh, it is the, the academic uh, integrity question is always uh, top of mind as well. So certainly want to be mindful of that. And we'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to see how we can get into some of that today as well. Uh, you know, in it, as genuine and as a way of, uh, as possible. Um, so before we do dive in very deeply with, uh, you know, the teaching and learning implications of it, I think we need to make sure that there's a level playing field. Do we, you know, do we all understand what AI is? And, you know, sometimes when we see it in action, we get wowed by it. And that wowing is completely understandable because the very definition of AI is for computers to be able to mimic and emulate human intelligence. So when we see them, mimicking or emulating human intelligence. They're doing exactly, AI is doing exactly what it's designed to do. Uh, and uh, it's not something that just happened all of a sudden. The technologies in play here have been in play for decades, you know, 1940s and 50s, uh, when the initial work on this type of, uh, you know, way of the initial kinds of pieces of the computer that have evolved over time uh, really uh, built on itself, right? So right now we have the components that go into computers in terms of the processors, in terms of how data is stored, how it's retrieved. Uh, all of that is such a, a, a tremendous accomplishment of the 20th and 21st century for us. And then just the ability to have searchable human knowledge. Those are the two critical pieces that have come together to really allow computers to say, I'm going to learn what humans know. And based on the tremendous power of computing that we have available now, can we, you know, index that information and can we refer to it? Um, and that's essentially, you know, if we look at what computer programs were originally designed to do, what we're typically familiar with is what are considered like the if then types of things, right? For example, if I wanted to see if a computer knows uh, of a car, I would have to, as a computer programmer, tell it, okay, if it's got, you know, four doors, if it's got four wheels, if it's got, uh, you know, four windows, then that's a car, right? And then I would show it a picture and say, is this a car? I would say, oh, four wheels, four doors. Yes, it's a car, right? Maybe I show it a picture of a, of a, of a coupe and then it's got two doors and all of a sudden the computer is going to say, I, I don't know how to compute that because I haven't been taught how to compute that. And what changes with machine learning or essentially a, a computer's ability to learn 
is we can say instead, hey, here are 10 million pictures of what we consider cars, right? From different angles, different styles, all different kinds of things. And what the computer is then trained to do is in this particular example, here's the pattern I want you to learn. So then next, if I show you the next picture of the computer or of a car, it's able to use its history of knowledge of we've just fed into it and training it. Yes, this is a car. No, this is not a car. This is a car. This is not a car. It takes all that learning and it's able to say, yeah, okay, what you've shown me next, it is a car and I'm 87.5% sure, right? Or what some kind of a, some kind of a, a surety kind of a, a percentage on that. And there's lots of practical uses, uses of this, right? Spam filtering for your email accounts, your credit card fraud detection. I think there's a, a billion credit card transactions a day, just not possible for humans to analyze each one that's coming through. And so it, 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 you know, artificial intelligence is able to say, here's a billion transactions that happened yesterday. And of, of those, these are the ones that were fraudulent. Okay, so now I'm detecting patterns on how to tell if, uh, if credit card you know, transactions, the next one that comes in, is it fraudulent or not? Does it match this fingerprint that I've been taught from these previous transactions? Uh, you may be using it, you know, you write beautiful and amazing emails and they auto complete sometimes to tell you what the next word could be. Uh, that's using artificial intelligence as well. It's really a time for statisticians to, to rejoice. Essentially, that is what, uh, what we see today in terms of generative, uh, generative artificial intelligence, you know, this whole prediction of what's going to be the next word. That's essentially all. Uh, all what that is 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 a predicting game, right? And and it's uh, and and how well that system is able to predict is the model that's being evaluated for that artificial intelligence. So there's a couple of keywords to really know here, and that's narrow intelligence and general intelligence. So ANI or artificial narrow intelligence, that's has a lot of useful and specific functions. Right? It's got it's very sophisticated. It's important to know that all of the progress that we know today when it comes to artificial intelligence, that it's kind of in the public sphere conversations, that is all narrow intelligence. This is, you know, this includes something as complicated as self-driving cars. Um, it has the capability of being able to say as it's driving down, some of you guys may have a Tesla or have seen somebody driving a Tesla, I'll show you a picture of a, a construction cone or a human. Um, it's, you know, that's all narrow intelligence. It's able to train itself uh, or it's been trained to be able to say, this is what I'm seeing. Uh, and, you know, what it's not able to do is say, oh, is that human a construction worker telling me to stop? Or is it a child trying to cross the street? Those kinds of things that it may not know. Uh, and that gets us into the realm of what's called artificial general intelligence, which is being able to replicate what humans can do. Uh, is it even possible? I mean, it's somewhat of a theoretical concept still. Most folks think that we're still decades away from being able to do, uh, to be able to have artificial general intelligence. Uh, typically when you're watching sci-fi thrillers, they're mimicking general intelligence in many ways. Uh, but, but you know, computers are not sentient. They may feel like it because they've gotten so good at mimicking that human uh, element, but uh, it's all narrow intelligence at this time. So it's okay to relax a bit. Uh, and hopefully some of that agitation that you're feeling and that uneasiness uh, can be allayed with that. But it's important to not relax too much because AI does have implications for the world, right? Uh, and I think the two questions that I want to ask you, one is, you know, can your students, you've got graduation coming up, May 11th, 12th, and 13th, right? Huge, three days of graduation, commencement exercises, it, can your students graduate from Texas A&M and not learn about how AI is impacting their field or their profession or their lives around the world around them? Can they still be ready for the world that awaits them if they're not learning about that? And then similarly, you know, can you teach? Can you keep teaching the exact same way because somehow AI doesn't impact your classes? And I think because specifically of generative AI, the answer to both of those questions has to be a no. Because generative AI, artificial intelligence, as we talked about was, you know, if AI can be trained, a funny thing happened, right? As 
this predictive modeling was happening that says, here's the next word you're trying to think is because it's able to analyze all of this content that exists on the internet, because the model can be trained to say, here's all knowledge that we know and developments in what's called natural language processing or, and computer vision. The idea is it understands human language and different types of languages. Uh, you know, at, at Texas a for your school of education, the bilingual education is very important. So having systems that understand multiple languages, that becomes very important. So here it's able to understand that natural language processing. Those, uh, those things coming together have really allowed a just a growth of tools, not just chat GPT, but many other tools that allow it to say, it allow the systems to say, not just here's what I predict the next word will be, but based on the prompt that you've provided, here's my prediction for what each next word would be until I've strung together a full thought or a full paragraph or a complete sentence or whatever it may be in that context. And that's why generative AI is what's really kind of creating this uneasy feeling. Um, and uh, But that's also where a tremendous amount of promise exists as well. So I wanna share a, a little bit about the, uh, the course that I teach. It's an intro to information systems management course. I understand that the content may not be really relevant uh, for your teaching content, but essentially I've got an essay assignment that I do in the class uh, and it's all business students from all different uh, of the business uh, majors that are in my class, about 120 of them. And I had them working on an essay assignment where they think of a scenario that they're working in their chosen profession and they're tasked with evaluating some kind of an emerging technology uh, and they're supposed to make a recommendation to their senior executives on it. Uh, and then they submit a draft, they review a peer draft, and then they submit a final version of their essay. And what it allows me to do is work on some key skills with them, right? They engage with a librarian to learn about library databases and other resources that are available. They learn to appreciate the difference between writing for business settings versus typically when they're writing for their English classes and maybe it needs to be a little bit more creative versus very concise and pointed language. Um, they learn to keep up with how to identify and, and uh, learn about emerging technologies, creates a competitive advantage for them. And then it also gives me an opportunity to uh, have them give peer feedback using the ask method, actionable, specific, kind, something that we, uh, we talk about in professional contexts uh, throughout. And, uh, you know, so what I did this past uh, holiday season, you know, kind of relaxing uh, with family over the holidays. And I said, OK, let's let's dive into chat GPT. Let's figure out what's going on here with the 3.5 version that's out. Uh, you know, is it really as compelling? Has it really made these leaps and bounds that people are talking about? And it did. It really did quite well. It gave me five compelling technologies that are impacting accounting, right? Blockchain and, and uh, uh, cloud computing, RPAs. Uh, and then it said, okay, here are five very good reasons why you should adopt blockchain. And then it gave me six very good reasons about why I should be cautious about blockchain, um, you know, complete with the caveat. And so it got me thinking, is it, can I really enter the spring semester, you know, keeping my original essay assignment? And it did all of these things incredibly fast. And that's the one thing that you always hear about, GPT 3.5 within seconds being able to give you these kinds of responses. So what I did was I redesigned my assignment. I said, you know what, we're gonna have multi-part assignments. It's gonna be three parts. In part one, I just want you to play with chat GBT. Use different types of prompts, you know, as if uh, on a subject that you're familiar with. I had students asking it about equestrian because that's something that they were very familiar with or about uh, sailing or about Adam Sandler movies because that's something that they felt that they knew a lot about. Uh, and then they experimented with different prompts for emerging technologies, kind of like that original uh, assignment that I had. And then they wrote a brief reflection about these interactions. That was kind of the first part of what they did. And then the second part, what they did was I put them in groups or they self-assigned into groups of four and they were tasked with creating an eight minute podcast in a conversational style, articulating what were the most compelling or engaging aspects of their, uh, of their reflections. And then I had them also, what they're doing right now, they're evaluating uh, three other podcasts uh, from the three other from three other teams. So I've got thirty total podcasts, and each uh, each team should receive some reasonable feedback from peers who have watched their podcast as well as submitted their own. Uh, 
Um, so it still allows me to reach some of that original goals, right? Of can you articulate, you know, can you find emerging technologies? Can you articulate them? Can you engage with this incredible new tool that's going to be available to you in your professional environment? Can you still practice effective, actionable, specific, and kind feedback for your peers? Um, and so far, the feedback's been really great. You know, students have been saying, hey, this encouraged me to explore and experiment. I wouldn't have otherwise done that. It leveled the playing field. If the assignment was still an essay, you know, the students who did their own work would feel penalized. And that's a really important point here. Uh, and uh, interacting with ChatGPT opened my eyes about the extent of its capabilities in, in a way that reading about it wouldn't have done. And we all know about that engaged learning aspect, right? If they're engaging with the learning, they're learning far better. <clears throat> You know, again, conversations about speed of how quickly it gives the responses, you know, informative, humorous, uh, things like that. They're engaging in conversations with it. People are saying, hey, I can see myself using this tool. I can learn, I can use it in my professional setting. I, I prefer using ChatGPT rather than having to scroll and find a search answer on Google. You know, this is kind of what unsettled Google a little bit about how their search engine works. Um, so, and then why did I do a podcast? You know, it's, uh, I still, we're not going to dive into web three concepts today, but the idea of, you know, this idea of a creator economy where students see themselves as creators who are uh, building content, but also contributing to the content that can be used by others in a way that still allows them to retain their ownership. Podcast is an important skill to develop in that context of uh, being able to articulate uh, their professional, uh, you know, consequences of, of the tools that they're seeing and they're using in their class uh, today uh, is an important skill. It's hard to plagiarize a video podcast, right? It has to be them that's doing the, the podcast. Um, and I'm wondering if instead of reading an essay from a peer and editing it for or reviewing it for feedback, uh, if I wonder if a peer review of a pod, a video podcast builds a better uh, sense of community and connection with their with their peers. I don't know. Uh, I'm looking to see how I can measure that, but certainly an element that's that's worth exploring for me. And then there's other tools, right? There's tons of other sources. We saw ChatGPT. There's one called consensus.app. What it does is uh, you go in and you type in a research question and it says, you know what? Here's the, uh, here's the lit review for basically what you've asked as your research question. This is using uh, natural language processing, right? It's able to analyze the learning of this is based on all refereed journal articles that are available in public domain uh, and some context not available in the public domain, but that's not my uh, challenge for the, this app. Um, but then they're able to go through and say, here is, you know, here's, here's where your research question is addressed in these articles. Um, and, you know, there's also uh, resources available from UNESCO uh, variously, and I, in just a moment, I'll drop in the chat uh, the uh, the recent report that was um, published and it shows here are the different types of uh, roles that AI can play in assignments for your classroom. You know, can it be the motivator? Can it be the study buddy? There are different ways of engaging with ChatGPT specifically in your class to to redesign these types of assignments. Uh, in other words, there's a lot of conversation happening about what are the different ways of redesigning these courses. What are the different ways of redesigning individual assignments? Uh, and that may be a, a, an easier approach, right? And so uh, if you've got assignments that you particularly feel could be at risk um, of, of being plagiarized easily or being copied easily, those are good assignments to think about going back to the principles of like, you know, why am I doing this assignment? What am I really hoping for them to learn out of this? And then, you know, what happens is we get in the habit of grading the output submit the essay and I'm going to grade the essay. Instead, what you could do is go take a step back and say, you know what, instead I'm going to work on scaffolding this assignment in a way that allows me to actually grade the process and the progress that you're making over time. And so then you're going to have to submit your actual research questions. You're going to have to submit your outline. You're going to have to submit, you know, a, a first draft of it, and then you're going to have to edit. Um, and so when they start thinking, not only is the learning improved, because then they're thinking about the process of the progress, um, but it also, you know, makes it that much more challenging uh, to make that uh, an assignment that is being done with artificial intelligence. I will say about academic uh, integrity is that that's a concern even outside of artificial intelligence. There are 
you know, there are many things that students can and do cheat on uh, that have nothing to do with artificial intelligence. And so it really does require a more holistic view of how you're designing your assignments and how students are engaging with learning in order to really be able to address some of the core uh, reasons why students may be cheating. Um, so if that's a concern that you have, uh, then AI is not going to do anything novel for you in terms of uh, preventing or creating cheating. Dr. Ali? Uh, um, yeah, question? Uh, a question in the chat says, "Is did you say that this chart is from UNESCO? Correct. I will share the actual PDF of the report in just a moment in the chat as well. Thank you. You can continue. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just from, uh, you know, uh, from that perspective, um, so I want to kind of dive into how we're, we're supporting um, artificial intelligence uh, at Auburn. Just kind of very quickly, what we've done is, you know, we looked at, we said, okay, uh, we've, we have the need to elevate the conversation about AI and education at Auburn. We also have a lot of faculty and professional staff who are very busy with their professional lives, very busy probably in their personal lives. And now we're asking them, hey, you've got to learn this new skill. You know, what that really sounds like is the same thing that we talk about when we create online learning. Why do we need to create online courses and programs? Because there's professionals who are working very hard, engaged fully, they're busy with their personal lives, and now we need, you know, they need to learn something in order to be able to keep up or advance in their professions. And so what we did was we said, you know, this is really an opportunity for us to build an online course that's focused on teaching with AI. It's so we've that's what we've done. We've developed a self-paced, fully online, self-directed course. It actually is designed in a way that builds community for us on campus. Um, and it elevates the conversation about AI and education. And it also is being built by our Auburn online team, which reports to me. And you know, we're able to engage some really high quality instructional designers, uh, creative developers. And so now not only are faculty engaging in the content, but they're also experiencing what a high quality engaging online course feels like. So it's emulating you know, that as well. And now they're engaging hopefully with us on, on that element as well, they will. Uh, uh, hopefully, in the in the text in the context of hey, I like the way this course was designed. How do I do that for my course? And that elevates all learning on campus as well. And this uh, course that we've designed just in the spring, we started right around the beginning of the semester, and and the course is fully done. We've done a soft launch on campus. Already have about 150 faculty going through it, uh, and uh, it's a uh, you know we did a survey of students and learning about how they use AI tools. So there's a module on, you know, how students are using it and how do we how do we encourage faculty to partner with their students? Uh, what are the ethical considerations? You know, how do we how do you think about redesigning assignments or redesigning an entire course? Uh, how do we empower you to have conversations with your department within your department or within your discipline about the implications of this uh, platform or this tool that's available? Um, the way we've done it is we've said, you know what, there's going to be three types of interactions in this course. You can explore the content. You can play with actual AI tools. And then we ask you to articulate what it is that you see the implication in the context of that module for that particular course. And we do it through four lenses. We say, you know, this content can be seen in a technical perspective, a theoretical perspective, pedagogical or ethical implications. So those are the lenses that the learners are going through and engaging with the content from. And then that's where the articulation is also coming in. So, uh, and then as folks go through the course, they can earn a digital badge. Uh, we are doing an Explorer badge uh, for those who complete the course uh, and provide the, the reflective uh, element, the reflection pieces in there. And then if, uh, if anybody uh, who completes the course goes through and uh, engages uh, and implements something in their uh, classroom and then does a reflection on that, then that earns them an experimenter badge as well. Uh, and again, like I said, we just this week is actually when we're going to start a little bit more of a marketing effort around it. We're going to be sending out postcards and emails and things like that. Uh, but already with just the word kind of catching on itself, we've had about 150 folks already sign up. And so looking to engage with those folks. Um, and then when I think about for yourself as well, right, what are the next steps? And uh, and I really, you know, you need to give yourself time and space to to try the tools and to, and to think about them from your perspective of how do you see 
you know, these tools implemented implemented in your learning context, maybe a different way for your graduate students and a different way from your undergraduate students. Uh, and then you want to reward the behavior you want to see. I'm going to dive into this a little bit, a little bit more, right? So with your students, you have to talk about AI with them, right? Hey, this is all new. I'm still learning it as well. What do you know, right? When is it okay to use it? When is it not okay to use it? Um, talk about it with your colleagues. There are folks on your campus who are supporting the use of technology. And I know you guys just recently are, uh, have gone through a major LMS transition. Those folks have tremendous expertise in terms of how to use technology in the classroom, technology in your teaching and learning context. Engage them and let's reward those folks, right? Because those are the folks that are going to help you with this next major kind of transition of how do I continue to evolve what I'm doing in my classroom to respond to the kinds of things that are happening outside the classroom as well. Um, and then also how you how we all collectively engage with uh, educational technology. There's lots of really bad tools out there and there's some really good ones. Uh, we use on campus, we use Gradescope, which is a tool that's developed by Turnitin. What it does is it allows our um, uh, sciences and math faculty to grade handwritten uh, assignments much faster because it uses that same learning, right? If you, if you have 800 people taking a calculus exam on paper, you scan all those 800 copies in, you grade the first one, it says, hey, out of these 800, looks like about 300 of them have similar markings. Do you want me to go ahead and give the same amount of points to these as well? And that's a program that learns on itself, right? And so that's a tool that we've used. It's cut down grading time tremendously. So there are significant advantages to using these kinds of tools in the classroom as well for your own uh, for your own benefit. So these are some of the thoughts. And again, I kind of want to really get into the question and answer session. And you guys are welcome to reach out to me as well. Um, and uh, with that, I'll I'll open it up. All right, Dr. Ali. Dr. Irby had a question. How many hours is this training course you were just speaking about? Um, so it's eight modules. I think uh, somebody could complete, it depends on how much somebody wants to dive into it, but it's uh, it can all be done within a few hours. Okay. Not a day's kind of a thing. Just how much time you're willing to put in. Mm -hmm. uh, each module, uh, if it's done thoroughly, each module would take, uh, you know, some modules would take about an hour. Um, so. And is this open for anyone to sign up? Uh, so it's not open for anyone to sign up yet. It's open for anyone at Auburn to sign up. Gotcha. And, uh, we're working with uh, the SEC to try to see if we can make it available more broadly. And then we've, they've got a, we've got a couple of institutions who've reached out to us. And what we can do is create a Texas A&M version of the course where anybody with a TAMU.edu login could log in and, and use the course. And that's kind of what we're trying to set up so you'd be able to do that. Um, but we can follow up on how to make that happen in terms of licensing the, co the course for your own use. Cool. Okay, I'm ready for new questions in the chat. Um, anything about AI or anything Dr. Ali was talking about or maybe implications in your classroom or clarifications he may provide, um, go ahead and drop them in and I can moderate that discussion. I'll give you a few minutes because I know some of y'all are probably typing and this is a little complicated topic, so it might take a while to try and word your question correctly. And I'm going to drop a link to that UNESCO study that I just referenced as well. So that awesome. Can, so the PDF file is linked there. Just came out last week, I believe. So very fresh off the press. Okay. And uh, the particular part that I referenced in terms of the, the different ways, I mean, there, it, of course, the whole report talks about specifically about, specifically about chat GPT. Um, but then uh, about halfway through, I think it's on page, if I'm not, I think it's hidden. So page nine has the table that I shared in terms of the specific examples of how it can be used. Okay, Dr. Irby's asking, do you have any like anecdotes of people who have used chat GPT in classes before? Sure. Uh, we've got, uh, I was engaged, engaging with a faculty member in our psychology department and he was uh, talking about how they use chat GPT to actually do the R coding that their students need to be able to do in their class because 
typically what would happen is the students would really struggle with the code for R so much that he didn't really get a chance to dive into the analysis piece as much as he would like. And so now because ChatGPT can help with the coding, they still understand the syntax, they still copy and paste, you know, and, and, and are able to do the basics of what they need to do in terms of engaging with R, but now he can spend a lot more time uh, in terms of uh, talking about the analysis piece, which is actually the skill that he wants them to develop much more. Okay. Um, there's also, yeah, so there's different examples. We've seen a uh, faculty who are uh, using uh, ChatGPT to help with idea generation, not necessarily, uh, you know, trying to give your students a safe way to use it rather than, you know, risking them typing an entire assignment with it. Um, they, uh, you know, they'll, they'll say, okay, given the context of X, Y, Z, can you suggest some, uh, you know, can you suggest some research questions or things like that? And so the idea generation piece becomes, um, interesting. Okay, cool. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I have another question from, um, a classmate of mine. Okay. And the question is, have you seen people use chat GPT to grade their work using the rubric as a guideline to improve the quality of their writing skills and writing a paper? Yeah, that's a really, so if you want to use it to evaluate your own paper uh, that I have seen that, but I, I got to share with you, the reliability of that has not been that great. Um, again, and I want to tell you why, because at, at the core of it, if you start saying, hey, can you use this rubric to evaluate my work? What you're saying is, give me a shot, uh, you know, give me, give me your best shot at this one-off kind of an assignment. Now, the flip side of that is, if you had a thousand assignments that had been submitted using that one rubric, and then you trained a system to say, using this rubric, right? Here's a good assignment. Here's a not as good assignment. Here's the way it's deficient. And then you gave it that, 1,001st assignment and said, now here's the next one. Tell me what on that rubric, how would you evaluate this one? Then that's really where the response would be much better. Um, with one-off kinds of rubric analysis like that, it's, gonna, it's not going to be as reliable. I think what you could do is say, here's a sample of writing. You know, does it meet the correct, uh, you know, then you ask a pointed question in terms of like rephrasing that rubric into a more meaningful prompt, then I think you may get some useful results from that perspective. So something as if, can you evaluate all my citations based on APA formatting? Oh, I'm not sure if, uh, I'm not sure if it does that, actually. That's a good question. I have not <laughs> I, tried I that. I think I've heard some chat about it in my classes, so I wanted to ask Very because that would be helpful. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next question is- a tarot at that point. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> The next question is, how do you think the role of the instructor as a facilitator of learning may need to be redesigned to best fit the utilization of AI in online or physical classrooms? Yeah, so I think we've already seen this. Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've, we've been seeing this transformation of, of instructors from, you know, being that guide in terms of uh, the way that um, the, the content is not necessarily the centerpiece, but it's that engagement um, between the student and the instructor using that content. Um, so it's, it's not so much that the role has to be redesigned. It's, uh, I think we have to recognize that this type of AI is simply another tool. And uh, you know, for those of you that are sharing with your students how to use different tools in their in their learning growth, this will simply be another tool for them to become familiar with and learn how to use, um, you know, and so if you have been guiding them on how to, you know, uh, depending on different contexts, right, so if you've been, if it's a very hands-on course, here's how you use, you know, SPSS or R to do data analysis, now this is also, hey, here's how you use AI for, a, you know, for generating ideas or, or engaging in this content. Um, so depending on what the context is of the course that you're doing, uh, I think it, it, it's an important tool. And I think it's, uh, it's something that you should discuss with your students in the context of your profession, in the context of your course. Um, but in terms of it, you know, um, fundamentally changing the role of the instructor, I don't think we're there yet. 
Hey, thank you so much. Um, Matt, yeah, Stevens, would you like to ask your question? Hey, let me tell myself. Hi, thanks for the presentation. It was awesome. Um, I was wondering with this AI, is our uh, our copy editors going to become obsolete? <laughs> so you know that's a very good question. Um, I, again, you know, like I think it, it, with mixed results, I do mm -hmm. know of mm -hmm. a, a couple of companies that are hiring fewer technical writers mm -hmm. because uh, of what they're able to, you know. And, and the best way to think about it is. Uh, you know, there's something called, for example, 10x engineers, right? Mm -hmm. The idea is if you graduate 100 engineers, uh, let's just say that they're all average engineers, right? 1x. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe one of them is incredibly gifted. Mm -hmm. And what you do, is, you know, and that one person may be a 10x engineer. And what mm -hmm. that means is they're able to do 10 times more work than the average engineer can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what a tool like this would do for that person is instead of a 10x engineer they would become a 100x engineer maybe it, it mm -hmm. multiplies their output right mm -hmm. but then what it does for the average engineer is instead of a 1x engineer they can become a 10x engineer mm -hmm. and so i think if you think about uh you know even engaging with your students or engaging with uh you know employees in that context mm -hmm. then yeah you know if, if you've got three copy editors already maybe you don't need to hire that fourth copy editor because mm -hmm. of what mm -hmm. tools that are available mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. I also saw a question about Grammarly being used. And I mm -hmm. think uh, that's an important one to, to think about from a tools perspective. So uh, a future version, a very, you know, as soon as maybe this summer, uh, a future version of Office 365, which is Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and those things will include a feature called Copilot. And what Copilot is, is generative AI built in to those tools that you're already using. So you use Microsoft Word, and now Microsoft Word will have Copilot, which is essentially Chad GPT on the back end, mm -hmm. built into your Microsoft Word document. So mm -hmm. you could start a sentence, something like, you know, World War II was very good for, you know, in, in the industrial development of the US because. And it'll complete that thought for you if you use Copilot. Or you could say the six most important, uh, you know, professional opportunities for teachers are, and then it'll generate those six outputs, right? So now it's doing that work for you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this idea of policing how AI is used becomes, and it will continue to become much, much more challenging mm -hmm. than what we're seeing right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so trying to somehow keep up with being able to detect if it's being used is going to become uh, almost a futile effort, quite frankly. And it also becomes a little fuzzy, right? Because if somebody submitted an essay assignment to you and they didn't use spell check or they didn't use grammar check, you would count off points, probably. But now, because they are using Copilot, you're going to kind of like, so... Where do you draw the line in terms of what tool is okay to use and what tool is not okay to use? Um, and, you know, so those are the things that you want to think about uh, in terms of that context. Awesome. Thank you so much. Dr. Pasham Farouche, would you like to ask your question? Thank you for this great presentation. Uh, I have a question about uh, students and teachers AI literacy. That how are uh, students and teachers AI literacy considered in designing and developing your course? Thank you so very much. Uh, so let me make sure I understand the question. When you say uh, students and teachers AI literacy, so because my course is an introductory course, for my specific course, I'm actually using it as an opportunity to build understanding of artificial intelligence in the course, uh, in the context of, of learning. Uh, and so that's how I'm addressing it personally, is that I'm not assuming that they know what it is, and I'm not assuming that they've used it before. Uh, but part of it is me yes. also wanting them to find and build that confidence of using it themselves. Uh, the course for the uh, faculty development, it also doesn't assume uh, pre-existing AI literacy. In fact, we've designed it so that if someone is very technically 
advanced in their AI understanding, they will take the course and gain a lot because they may learn about how to use it in the teaching and learning context much better than they would otherwise, just given their only, only their technical understanding. On the flip side, someone may have experience with teaching in the higher ed context, but doesn't understand the terminology as well when it comes to AI. Words like machine learning, words like natural language processing, those kinds of things. Can we build content in a way that elevates their understanding as well so that they're able to make a more uh, meaningful contribution to the conversation, a very important conversation that's happening about um, the considerations of, of AI? Hopefully that answered both of the context of those, the possible context of that question. Yes, thank you so very much. Thanks Great. for the information. Nahid, I noticed that you have your hand up as well, if you'd like to. Yes, Dr. Abdel Rahman, you are next on my list. Go ahead and talk to us. Okay, first I want to say thank you, uh, Dr. Ali, for this amazing presentation. And actually the AI is the scientific revolution for this century, I believe. Um, like I just like read like the first five days of the chat GPT, like they have about more than 1 million users in five days, which is really like the first day, like the first uh, tool that have that that number of users in the in this, I mean, in this decade, actually. Um, I mean, comparing with Facebook, comparing with Twitter, with all of these, I think the, the chat GPT has really exceeded all of these uh, tools. So my question is about like the accuracy. I, I uh, like I I hear Dr. Stevens and also Dr. Peshma Farusha asking about the accuracy and the concerns actually from the faculty um, after students using it for their assignments. So how accurate will it be? Because I tested myself, <laughs> so I did your first step. So when you said like we can. Um, try with like the, the the knowledge that we are familiar with. So I give the I give it like the assignment. I started like reading what it's written. It's really fine and it's really good. But when I go through the, the references, it shows me like references that are not existed. Actually I just ask it like um reference Nahid Abdurrahman uh, because I know I have some references related to the topic but it showed me references that I didn't write. So I was so surprised, like I didn't write this. So I, that's the thing, my concern is- Or maybe you did write them just in time <laughs> for the annual review. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, so my, my concern is like, if the students will use it as a their easy yeah. way to complete their assignments, how as faculty will be able to figure out this is not the students, productivity or this is not their product, this is the, the AI. Yeah, lots of questions to unpack there, uh, Dr. Rahman. So I wanna start with first the accuracy aspect of it. And it is, uh, it, it is the only thing that's giving us a little bit of time right now, quite frankly, is that uh, we can rest assured that it's not 100% accurate. But I'll tell you, it's important to know that how AI exists today is the worst it'll ever be, right? Right now, it is the worst it will ever be. It will only get better from here. Uh, and, we, and we don't even quite understand the implications it'll have on other things that we use on an everyday basis as more and more industries learn. I mean, will grocery store experiences change, for example, right? All There's all kinds of implications and, and, and processes um, that get affected in terms of uh, this technology. And so uh, the, the point about it being the worst it is, is that the people who are developing these tools are not immune from hearing our feedback as we complain about it, right? So what they see is the academic community is saying things like, it doesn't even do citations. Well, guess what? there will be a version of it that will do citations better than any of us can do citations. Uh, and that, that'll be a piece that they respond to because they hear what the conversation has been. In fact, there are AI tools already out there that help with citation, that generate and identify those resources. You know, Consensus was one of the ones that I showed, but there's others that'll give you, you know, in context literature reviews with the correct citations because that's what they've been trained to do. 
ChatGPT hasn't been trained to do that, but there are other tools that have been trained to do that. And so, um, you know, it is not possible to detect if your students are doing the work or if it's AI that's doing the work. Uh, it is not possible to do that in a reliable fashion. Uh, and uh, and I, 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 at this point of where we are in terms of where the technology is and the tools that are available to detect the use of the technology, I don't want to give anyone any false hope or, or impression that they can somehow use a website that will tell them if, they're, if the work that's being done is done by AI or not. Uh, at best, some of them are around 10 to 12 percent uh, reliability, which is just not good enough. If anything, you're risking inequitable results, right? The other thing I also want to touch on is that you mentioned that you entered in, uh, you know, whether it could cite your work or not. And, uh, and this is an important topic, right? Because AI, we know, has been trained on existing knowledge that is publicly available. But unfortunately, it does come with its biases. And because you are a woman, uh, as best as I can tell on Zoom, and because you are, uh, you know, you, you maybe have a minority background or a name, that somehow creates a disadvantage in terms of you being referenced by AI tools. And so that's also another element that we need to make sure our students are aware of is that this tool is not going to improve their ability to have a more inclusive uh, learning experience. And if anything, they need to actually take extra steps to make sure that if they asked ChatGPT, for example, for the top five names in your particular research area and it doesn't list you, right? It only lists men, for example, or it only lists people in the US, for example, then that is not accurate either, even though those five people could be correct answers um, because it's ignoring a wealth of knowledge that we should expect AI tools to have. Kind of goes back to my previous point. We have to reward the work that we want to see in the world, right? Um, you know, that uh, if we reward the best engines in terms that give the best output, then that's where we'll see those gain more traction and that's what we need. Awesome. And then lastly, I think we only have time for one more. Um, Dr. Yoder, I see you have a comment on WorldCat. Would you like to provide some insight? Thank you, Jordan. Um, I was just sharing that um, WorldCat is just one source and tool that's provided citations for years and they even have some components of AI. So the students have been using that for a long time. Thanks for sharing. I actually didn't know about it. So I'm going to lock that one away. <laughs> All right. Well, if there are no more questions, I want to go ahead and um, thank Dr. Ali for spending time with us and sharing his insight on AI. And I'm going to hand it over for Dr. Irby to do a quick closing. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you again for helping to facilitate and thank you all for attending today. Uh, Dr. Ali, thank you for coming uh, on short notice, but thank you so much for being here and sharing. It's really uh, prompted a lot of questions and a lot of ideas. And um, we really, really appreciate uh, your support. And we hope we can call on you for uh, support in the future and uh, based on your knowledge, uh, extensive knowledge that you have. Thank you so much for being a part of uh, this uh, lunch brown bag. And uh, I don't know if anybody ate, I didn't see anybody eating, but anyway, I hope you got your lunch some, somewhere along the way. And so thank you so very, very much uh, for being here with us. We appreciate it. Absolutely, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you all. It was awesome. Have a great day. Thank you. And with that, I'll go ahead and close this session. I see lots of love for Dr. Ali's presentation in the chat and for Dr. Irby for bringing this knowledge to us. Um, and with that, have a great afternoon. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.